The East India Company has just been set up. Uh, the ambassador Thomas Rowe has been set up, uh, sent to India to uh, uh, develop a trading deal with, with Jahangir. Meanwhile, there's another Englishman here who is a beggar in Ajmer. And not just a beggar, but someone who has learned the languages and thinks of himself as a fakir. I find that extraordinary. It's such a difference from the colonial mindset of a Thomas Rowe, who told all his men who were in Ajmer, do not dress like an Indian, do not learn Indian languages. When we present ourselves to Jahangir, we will present ourselves wearing English clothes and speaking English. Whereas Thomas Coriat presented as a desi, um, a desi who loved kichiri. Uh, and that's the common thread in my stories. Kichiri, Aam, Narial, over and over again, these Farangis. Um, it's not just that they loved Indian foods, they opened themselves up to a vast palette of Indian cultural traditions, possibilities, ways of thinking. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Namaste. I, Mithilesh and Sumit, welcome you all to a new episode of the Eastern Report. Today, we have with us noted author, Jonathan Gil Harris. Welcome, Jonathan. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Today, we'll discuss Jonathan's book, The First Firangis, Remarkable Stories of Heroes, Healers, Charlton's, Courtesan, and other foreigners who became Indian. The First Firangi chronicles the lives of fascinating eight little-known foreigners from the 16th and 17th centuries who decided to become Indian. Jonathan Gil Harris uses his own experience of becoming Indian through the process of acclimatizing to the country's culture, custom, weather, food, clothes, and customs to bring the stories of these shadowy figures to vivid life. Jonathan Gill Harris is descendant from a long line of migrants on both sides of his family, born in New Zealand and educated in England. His day job is a professor of Shakespeare. He has written five books on English Renaissance drama and ideas of the foreign. He now lives in Delhi, where he is a professor of English and Dean of Academic Affairs at Ashoka University. This is the book. I request my viewers to read this gripping tales of Firangis who became Indian. So Jonathan, what motivated you to write the first Firangis, the book? Thank you for that, that question. Uh, Often there isn't a, a single motive, uh, and in my case there, there were probably several, but uh, preeminent amongst them. Uh, one was uh, an academic interest. Uh, the more I read early modern English accounts of uh, travel to India, the more I discovered uh, these uh, strange uh, figures who pre-existed English travelers who believe themselves to be the first uh, to have come to India. Um, so, for instance, uh, Ralph Fitch, uh, who was a, a merchant who, who traveled from England to India in the uh, uh, early 1580s, uh, he believed that uh, he was uh, one of the first Englishmen in India. Uh, but shortly after arriving, uh, he was arrested uh, in Goa and thrown in prison, and he got out only because a local interceded on his behalf. And this local turned out to be a man named Thomas Stevens, uh, an Englishman who had come to India several years before, escaping persecution in, in Britain. Um, Stevens was a Catholic, and uh, Britain, uh, during the middle of the 16th century, had gone through a massive convulsion um, 
when uh, Henry VIII uh, broke away from uh, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, declared himself the head of the Church of England. And England formally became a Protestant nation. Um, so Catholics were per persecuted. Stevens was amongst them, and he left first for Rome, then for Portugal, and then he migrated to, to Goa. Um, and he spent uh, the rest of his life on the subcontinent um, in a place called Rachol, right at the border of uh, uh, the Portuguese uh, state of Goa and uh, what is now Karnataka. And uh, he became known as Patri Guru. Uh, so he, to all intents and purposes, acquired something of an Indian identity. But he wasn't the only one I discovered. There were many other characters like this. Um, so I was interested in telling their stories. But also, after I migrated to India in uh, 2011, I found that uh, it became even more interesting to me to think about the experiences of uh, migrants, not just from England, but from many parts of the world, uh, what they had to go through uh, to acclimatize to a radically new, not just culture, but set of cultures, radically new climates, radically new uh, ways of living. Because I found that my experience as a migrant involved not just culture shock, but we could call it physiological shock. My body took quite a bit of time to adjust to um, the temperature, uh, to the food, uh, to all sorts of elements of my physical environment. And this despite the fact that I've been visiting India for a good 10, 15 years before I decided to move here. Uh, so as uh, readers of my book will know, it ended up becoming not just a history of all these shadowy migrants, but a kind of philosophical uh, engagement with what happens to our bodies when we change our locations. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so being a professor of English, how did it help you to write a gripping tale of uh, Firangis? Uh -huh. Well, in some ways, uh, being a professor of English was a disadvantage uh, because uh, I needed very much to get out of certain mindsets that uh, were second nature to me, including mindsets that are part of inhabiting the English language. Um, I had to learn not just a new language, but several new languages. Uh, in order to uh, make sense of the archives that I was drawing on for the first Ferangis. Uh, much of the information that, uh, uh, that I needed was in Persian, for instance, uh, some of it in European languages, but uh, most of it in, um, in Bhasha. Um, I've uh, had to learn Hindi. I've had to learn Urdu. Um, I wouldn't call myself proficient in, I'm certainly not a scholar of Hindi and Urdu. I'm, I'm capable of holding my own in a conversation. Um, but I've had to literally get outside myself in order to write this book and in order to, to be a migrant to, to this country. Uh, but uh, there is a way in which being an English professor was an advantage and in particular being a professor of Shakespeare because I'm not a historian. I'm a scholar of literature, a scholar of stories. And uh, to me, it was very important uh, to present uh, these histories as compelling narratives. But I think even more crucially than that, the archives I was dealing with in order to retrieve the stories of these Farangis are very, very sparse and in some ways problematic because uh, most of these poor people who migrated from various parts of the world to uh, the subcontinent in the 16th and 17th centuries, they were illiterate and very poor. So they didn't write their own stories. They didn't leave behind diaries or, or autobiographies. I had to uh, find their story through detective work. It was sort of the equivalent of chasing vapor trails. And that's where 
um, the very fine line between being a historian and being a storyteller becomes most apparent. Uh, of course, the word history contains within it the word story. Story and history are derived from the same etymological root in, um, in Latin. Um, we think of history as being all about facts. We think of stories as being all about fiction. But of course, any set of facts, uh, no matter how true they are, are always organized according to the protocols of narrative. Um, and uh, so trying to piece together the very few jigsaw puzzle uh, bits that I had from the archives involved uh, uh, some sort of quite careful uh, arrangement of the materials into to narratives that would be compelling. This doesn't mean that I'm embellishing or making up what's happening. I, I, I stand by uh, the fact that every word I say in the first Varangis is historically verifiable. Uh, but uh, there's a lot between the gaps in the archive that I've had to uh, uh, inhabit with imaginative projections, often using my own experiences as a 21st century Ferengi who has had to adapt to the very different world I'm now living in. So, uh, I mean, you talked about, uh, right, I mean, how there were challenges, not mentally, but even psychologically. Uh, and this is 21st century, right, where <laughs> the world is modern. And there are this many people who, who traveled from all over the world to uh, to Middle India and uh, pre-independence India, Middle India. And so what are the different challenges they had to fa face and how did they, they accommodate themselves? Well, you're absolutely right. My experience as a migrant is very different from theirs in, in many respects. Now, here I am speaking with you in English, um, which is, uh, it's actually not my native tongue, English. Um, I grew up, my, my first languages were Polish and Hebrew. But English was the language that I grew up with, and it's a language that I continue to speak here, that I teach in. Uh, by contrast, the other Ferengis who migrated to India had to shed their, their first languages. They had to learn Brajbasha, they had to learn Marathi, Konkani, uh, versions of Malayalam. Um, and so the movement into other languages was much more immersive for them than it has been for me. Uh, also, you know, I often joke about it, but it, it's in fact not a joke. Here I am talking to you from a living room in a plush South Delhi home that is air conditioned. So I can modulate my environment and make it cooler. Um, the Farangis who came in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, were often living in very, very um, straightened circumstances. Um, they certainly didn't have air conditioning. And uh, they didn't have uh, the luxury of uh, 21st century supermarkets out of which they could recreate uh, their diets from other parts of the world. I mean, I prefer desi kana to anything I've eaten in the West. Uh, but still, if I miss an Italian salad, I can get one. Uh, but the Ferengis who came in the 16th and 17th centuries had to eat completely new food, which often violently disagreed with their, their systems. And uh, a lot of the records I've dealt with are accounts of uh, Ferengis suffering from various uh, illnesses, um, heat exhaustion in particular. Um, so one of the Ferengis that I've already spoken about him, Thomas Stevens, uh, when he came uh, to India, he almost died from heat exhaustion coupled with dysentery until a local Hakim prescribed him Nariyal Pani. And he became an evangelist for the Nariyal, the coconut. He spent much of his life writing about the amazing properties of the coconut that uh, you can make you know, kishmish curry out of it, that uh, konkan uh, curry. Um, Toddy, and uh, you can make out of it. Uh, you can burn the husk uh, to produce a charcoal, which will keep you warm in winter. Uh, you can turn the husk into rope, which in coir, which is useful for 
interior design, but also for ropes and sailing. And the leaves of the coconut tree, he says, are unsurpassed for writing shayari on. Um, so uh, this is an example of how he had to adapt to a radically new environment uh, in ways that also transformed him. Uh, so the transformations I'm speaking about uh, with the, the Farangis of the 16th and 17th centuries are really significant. I think I've undergone massive changes as a result of the decade I've lived here in India, but they aren't as radical as the changes the Farangis had to experience that I write about in my book. Yeah, definitely very fascinating. I mean, the cockro uh, the coconut story you talk about. Uh, so obviously, I mean, they had to face a lot of hardships, which is very evident as you talk about, right? So then, why would anyone, I mean, migrate to pre-British India when there was so much trouble? I mean, why would someone go through that much trouble? Well, we just have to look at the situation in Europe um, and other parts of the world uh, from which uh, Farangis came. Um, Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries was uh, undergoing uh, all sorts of hardships. Uh, this was a time of war, a time of mass poverty, of starvation, a time of religious persecution too. A lot of the Farangis who come from Europe are religious refugees. Uh, and uh, this was something that really captured my interest I'm Jewish, and I was amazed to discover that uh, many of the people who uh, came to India masquerading as Christian Farangis, uh, and uh, once they arrived, they would get jobs as mercenaries and uh, acquire names like Farangi Khan. Um, but uh, they were, in fact, Jews uh, fleeing the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal. So Garcia da Horta, uh, who is uh, the first Farangi I speak about in the book, uh, he is now regarded as a hero of Portuguese uh, history. Uh, you could, before the uh, EU did away with uh, local currencies and introduced the euro, uh, one of the uh, Portuguese uh, uh, notes uh, included the picture of Garcia da Horta on it because he was the first physician uh, from the West to write a treatise on tropical medicine. Um, and he wrote this uh, based on his experiences as a physician in Goa. But what wasn't known, known about him was that he was secretly a Jew, and that he'd come to Goa to escape the Inquisition in Portugal. And when the Inquisition was set up in Goa, he fled again to Ahmednagar, to uh, the Sultan's court. He was fluent in Arabic, like many Jews were, and uh, he spent a number of years in the court uh, there. He received a lot of favors because he was an Arabic speaker. And he picked up on the medical traditions of uh, Arabic-speaking Hakims. Uh, now, a lot of this is suppressed in the book that he ended up writing about tropical medicine. Um, but he... Uh, his uh, understanding of medicine was very much the product of uh, speaking with uh, local doctors, both uh, Muslim and Hindu uh, in India. And he couldn't have spoken with them had he not been a Jew who could speak Arabic. Uh, there are a number of other Jewish figures who I found, uh, Farangis who sort of melted into uh, India, particularly the Dakini states uh, in the, the mid 16th century. Uh, there was another one named Frangi Khan, uh, whose original name was Sancho Pérez. Uh, he was uh, uh, a Jew who masqueraded as a Christian in order to get to India and then just sort of disappeared. And probably there are many such Jews who came from Europe, fleeing persecution. Jews, of course, had never known persecution in the subcontinent. This is actually one of the marvels. Uh, of the subcontinent, uh, that in 3,000 years of Jewish history here, uh, there is absolutely no evidence that uh, Jews have been discriminated against because they were Jewish. And I'm sure this is something that was known to a lot of the Jews in Europe. And it's one of the reasons why they chose to come here, even though in many cases they led grindingly poor lives. 
but to escape the specter of persecution was more important for them. Uh, no, um, I mean, you, you, you talked about how Jews were never prosecuted, persecuted uh, in India, and uh, I mean, there is actually a... Uh, so, so uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, that was actually going to be my next question. I actually wanted to understand, I mean, how, how much of a truth is to that statement. So thanks yeah. for saying that. Uh, but I mean, how long is that migration happening? Because as I understand, again, I mean, forgive me my understanding of Western history. What I understand is that Christianity did expand under Constantine right and uh, he, uh, constantine and his mother i forgot his, her name and they, they led to a uh, rise of christianity and how he adopted uh, became christian so would you say that i mean uh, the persecution might the persecution of jews might have started then and when did it start and did the migration started then or i mean at what year did it actually start so there has been Jewish migration to India for well over 2,000 years. Um, there, uh, we don't know for sure exactly when it started, but it seems almost certain that King Solomon, um, nearly 2,900 years ago, uh, developed trading links with South India. The Hebrew word for peacock, or rather the biblical Hebrew word for peacock, togkai, is related to the Tamil the ancient Tamil word for peacock, which suggests that peacocks became known to people in the Middle East as a result of a trading expedition between um, ancient Israel and uh, the ancient south of the subcontinent. And there were certainly Jewish uh, sailors, uh, Israelite sailors, sailing to the port of Muziris in um, what is now Kerala. Uh, Muziris is uh, near... Uh, Kranganor and, and Cochin. Um, now, persecution of Jews uh, by Christians began um, fairly early, but it became particularly intense underneath the Byzantines. Uh, and uh, this was uh, partly because uh, the story developed. Uh, some years after, the, probably a century or two after the death of Christ, the, the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ. So Jews became known as Christ killers. And uh, this is one of the interesting sort of twists of history. Um, for the longest time, Jews felt much more comfortable in uh, Muslim uh, Muslim cultures than they did in Christian cultures. There was much more affinity between Judaism and Islam, partly because Islam never accused Jews of being Christ killers, uh, but also because early Islam uh, developed out of uh, many of the practices of, of Judaism. Uh, Muhammad uh, initially prayed not in the direction of Mecca, of course, but of Jerusalem. And uh, the archangel who spoke to him was the archangel uh, Jibril, uh, who is uh, an archangel in, in Jewish uh, religion. Um, and he saw himself as part of a line of Jewish prophets. So for the longest time, Muslims and Jews were, if anything, allies. It's only comparatively recently that the story has developed that Jews and Muslims are timeless enemies. And the tragedy of Israel-Palestine has developed. The modern phrase Judeo-Christian, which I find very ugly, um, is a, a very modern fancy. For centuries and centuries, uh, Christians, for the most part, regarded Jews as absolute enemies. Um, and so the idea of a coherent Judeo-Christian tradition um, was something that uh, was sort of retrospectively imposed on history. Um, and it's been imposed with even more sort of force after World War II, after the Holocaust, and after the formation of Israel. But uh, for many, many centuries, Jews arriving in India from uh, a variety of locations, uh, whether it's uh, from uh, uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, from, uh, 
from the former Byzantine territories, uh, from France even, uh, some from Germany. The Pardesi Jews, uh, for instance, in uh, Kochi, um, distinguish themselves from the local, what, what they call the black Jews. So Jews have been discriminated against in uh, India, but by other Jews. So the Pardesi Jews saw themselves as the white Jews and uh, the local Jews who'd uh, been around probably since the time of Muziris were regarded as the black Jews and somehow not as uh, developed, as culturally developed as the Pardesi Jews who came from Europe. Um, but the fact is India repeatedly gave Jews from Europe a home uh, when they were facing persecution. And this is up and down the West Coast, but also uh, later in, uh, in Kolkata, um, in Madras, uh, there were significant populations of uh, Jewish migrants uh, who felt much more comfortable. They experienced uh, discrimination only when the Europeans came here. And uh, the Portuguese set up the Inquisition and, uh, and executed some Jews in Goa. Uh, the English brought with them some anti-Semitic attitudes uh, that uh, uh, were expressed strongly in Madras and Calcutta and, and Bombay. Um, but by and large, the Jews had a much better experience here in India than uh, they did in, in Europe. So as you, as you talk about how uh, there were anti-Semitic views when, when the uh, uh, right Western nations like uh, Portuguese, French, uh, British uh, occupied parts of the coastal India. So it's obvious or it seems very intuitive to me that probably Jews were more safer in the inlands of India rather on the coastal side, were probably under different Maharajas and under Mughals or under Marathas, for instance. So in what profession did they find? What, what I mean, how did they survive in India? Well, it's interesting. Jews stayed largely in the coastal areas. And I think uh, there, there's a fairly clear reason for that. The coastal areas were the most multicultural. Um, the port cities, the trade cities, where there were often uh, groups of people from uh, various parts of the Indian Ocean trading network, from Persia, uh, from Arabia, uh, even from East Africa, you know, there'd be communities of uh, uh, Muslims, Parsis. Um, there were large numbers of Habshis uh, from Ethiopia, uh, too, who came into port communities like Janjira, um, uh, just off the coast of Maharashtra. Um, and in fact, Jews and uh, the Habshi rulers of Janjira uh, ended up becoming extremely close so much so that Jandira, which was briefly a sort of independent principality, um, had a Jewish prime minister in the 19th century. Um, so I think uh, Jews felt safe in these uh, port uh, cities. Uh, uh, there were other examples that uh, Bombay was one, um, but also Chol um, in Maharashtra, um, which was an extra, it was Bombay before the British came along. It was uh, the biggest trading port in uh, uh, Maharashtra towards the Konkan coast. Um, and it was massively multicultural. You could hear an enormous number of languages uh, spoken there, Persian, Arabic, uh, but also Marathi, Konkani, etc., and Hebrew. Um, Cochin is another one. So these multicultural zones, uh, I, I think, uh, were spaces to which the Jews naturally gravitated. Places where uh, that may have been a little bit less multicultural inland uh, uh, were probably harder for the Jews to find a foothold in. Um, so there seem to have been some Jews who have settled in, um, uh, in Delhi, uh, in Hyderabad, even Patna. I found two Jews in Patna, um, who were, by the way, devotees of a Farsi saint, uh, whose own religious practice seems to have been a mix of Sufism and Tantric Hinduism. Uh, so this goes to show uh, how many extraordinarily uh, wide-ranging multicultural conversations were going on, that Jews could find common cause with a Parsi who was interested in Sufism and Tantric Hinduism. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary picture. 
and one that is worth keeping in mind now in this current moment where we're becoming increasingly polarized and uh, increasingly we understand identity as something singular rather than in conversation with other traditions. Yeah, I wish we could continue, I mean, discussing about Jews' history. I mean, is there a book? I mean, you should write one, too, Frank. <laughs> yeah, actually, my current book is called The Jewish Silk Road. And oh, okay. it's, it's about uh, the history of Jews across Asia from, um, uh, from Jerusalem to Kaifeng in China, uh, but all the way down to Cochin in India. Um, and uh, at least uh, a third of the book is about uh, Indian Jews. Yeah, I mean, it's very unfortunate, right? There are very few left, I mean, as I understand, because most of them moved to Israel after the formation of the state. So, yeah, I mean, definitely it would, would be a great treat. Uh, well, so I, I'm, just... one of the, I'm one of the Jews who's come back. Um, I, <laughs> maybe controversial of me to say, but um, I, I think uh, many Indian Jews who migrated to Israel, uh, believing that, it was, uh, that Jewishness was the most important part of their identity, have found that in Israel they don't quite fit in, uh, that they miss uh, the food, the language, the cultures of India. And uh, I'm someone who has always believed that uh, traditions flourish, not when they are all locked in a room where everyone is the same as you, but rather when we're in, we're in places where we can get outside ourselves and uh, our traditions are stronger for being in conversation with other traditions. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I just, I mean, really, I mean, it's one of my uh, dream to be to actually visit Israel one day because what I hear is that on Sabbath, I mean, again, I'm not very knowledgeable about uh, the festiv festivities of Israel and Jews, but what I hear is that you can get a lot of veg food there and it's so, so very easy to get, right? I mean, am, I, am I correct in saying that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's actually one of my wishes to visit someday. Uh, hopefully, it will happen sooner than later. Uh, ancient Indians called Yunani or Greeks Yavans. Did first Firangi came from France? <laughs> so, the history of the word Firangi is itself very interesting. Um, because uh, the word Firangi is like what it describes. It's a migrant. Um, so... The word appeared in the Middle East during the Crusades because uh, the Crusaders largely came from the Frankic kingdoms of what is, are now France and Germany. Um, and to Arabic uh, ears, Frank sounded like Farang. So that's how the word came into being. It then migrated to Persia where it became Ferangi, Ferangi and in India, it's become Firangi. Uh, but of course, it's become many other things in India too. And in, uh, Tamar Nadu, for instance, they say Palangi. Um, and uh, it's then migrated to Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, from there to Samoa, very near my native New Zealand, uh, where white people to this day are called Palangi. Um, so... It, it's fascinating to see how this word has sort of acquired this history. It's also referred to different things at different times. It initially referred just to Christians. Over time, it came to refer to white Europeans, irrespective of religion. There was a period in the uh, 18th and 19th century in India, um, probably as a result of uh, East India Company uh, soldiers uh, bringing terrible diseases with them uh, to India. Farangi became a synonym for syphilis. Um, it also became a name for a certain type of sword, a lethal sword. Um, interestingly, um, I encountered, when I was uh, doing a, a word search, um, I encountered many cases of people with the name Farangi who were not European or Christian. They were often... Uh, people of lower caste, even Dalits uh, from North India, whose parents had named them Farangi, presumably as, as a way of you know, raising their status. Um, so the, uh, the East India Company records include accounts of Dacoits uh, from uh, Bihar with names like uh, Farangi Singh. Um, 
And uh, I was interested thinking, oh, is, is this some Englishman who had become a dacoit? But uh, clearly not. Um, and of course, in the recent uh, film by Vishal Bhardwaj, comparatively recent film, um, uh, Omkara, uh, one of the main characters, Kesu Ferangi, is in fact a Brahmin gangster um, who, who has uh, received the name. So Ferangi has come to mean all sorts of things in, in different contexts. So, uh, Portuguese were the first to settle in India, followed by France and British. Do they represent the struggle of Europe to colonize the world? So, uh, the Portuguese uh, are an interesting case and a complex case. Uh, because, uh, on the one hand, uh, without the Portuguese, a lot of uh, colonialism wouldn't have happened. And uh, the Portuguese presence in India was often vicious. Uh, the Portuguese uh, sought basically to suffocate the multicultural Indian Ocean trading network that had joined the cultures of the subcontinent, uh, South Asia, including Persia, um, the Arabian Peninsula, and Eastern Africa for centuries. And the Portuguese systematically took over all the port cities uh, and committed a lot of violence to do so. But the Portuguese are also a little bit complex because they were far less, um, shall we say, uh, invested in remaining racially pure. So a lot of the Portuguese intermarried I mean, we see this in the abundance of uh, uh, Portuguese names in, in India uh, with people who seem to have nothing Ferangi about them. Uh, people with names like, you know, Anthony Gonzalez. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, uh, the Portuguese included many people who uh, were against Portuguese Christendom or looking to escape Portuguese, Portuguese Christendom. Uh, people who were undercover Jews, uh, and some of them uh, Moorish, uh, Muslims. Uh, so the Portuguese presence, Portugal couldn't have colonized uh, India without uh, the help of Jews and Muslims who understood the Indian Ocean trading network. Um, as soon as Portugal tried to uh, assert itself as a Christian power in India, People with Portuguese names fled out of the Estado de India and turned up in strange places all over India, um, in Bengal. Uh, one of the characters I speak about in the book is a pirate um, who became the Raja of uh, an island called Sandweep uh, in uh, the Sundarbans. Um, he was a working class uh, Portuguese man who intermarried with Bengalis and, uh, and Arakan uh, uh, Burmese. And uh, his uh, descendants still live today. Um, they have Portuguese names, uh, but they look uh, Bengali or Burmese. Um, so the Portuguese are a little bit different from the English, who, yes, there was a period, and William Dalrymple has chronicled this, where white Mughals would intermarry with Bibis. Um, but it was a fairly brief period before the British asserted absolute racial difference between black and white. Um, yes, there were Anglo-Indians who were the product of intermarriage. Um, but uh, I think the English left less of a genetic uh, footprint in India than the Portuguese did. There's no doubting that the Portuguese laid the foundations for the French and especially the English, uh, that the Portuguese did untold damage. I think the English did the most lasting damage uh, and uh, we're still facing the consequences of it right now. A runway from Venice, Niccolo Manucci becomes Indian and writes first hand accounts of Mughals. Please tell us about him. Yeah, Manucci is uh, such an interesting one. So he was a working class uh, boy in Venice. His uncle was a road sweeper. 
um, and he got on a ship and somehow managed to end up in the service of an English lord who came to India. Uh, he uh, was still only in his teens when he accompanied this lord uh, on a trip to Agra to meet uh, the great Mughal. But his lord dropped dead. We don't know quite what of, but you know, some disease, halfway through. And Manucci, who was still very young at this time, um, was left with all his lord's goods, trying to guard them um, in the middle of uh, Akbar's great highway from Delhi to Agra. When he was, account he was accosted by two dacoits, two Mughal dacoits, who turned out to be Englishmen, uh, who'd been serving uh, uh, Shah Jahan, um, but had gone rogue and uh, had become you know, bandits uh, out in the, uh, the wilderness of Haryana. Um, but um, Minucci somehow survived this encounter and ended up becoming uh, a servant uh, to the Mughals for a number of years. And he was a very enterprising, we could almost call him an entrepreneur, uh, because although he received no training in medicine, um, he uh, passed himself off as a doctor, uh, partly because of his white skin and uh, People in the cities that he moved through, including Delhi and Lahore, um, presumed that because he had a white skin, he must be a doctor, and must know something about medicine. So he started practicing medicine and seemed to be reasonably good at it. But he only became a truly qualified doctor when he moved south uh, to Tamil Nadu. And he lived on uh, St. Thomas Mount, uh, just outside of what is now Chennai. Um, and he became a student of uh, uh, Unani medicine. Uh, he became a Siddhavadiya, uh, which is extraordinary. He, he immersed himself fully uh, in this uh, tradition of medicine, this ancient tradition of medicine. And he became renowned amongst uh, both uh, local Hindus and Muslims, but also European settlers, uh, his abilities and uh, treating people. Now, what's interesting is he lived from the age of 14 till probably about 80 in India. So most of his life, he was basically an Indian. But uh, when he got into his advanced old age, he suddenly expressed a desire to go back to Europe. He wondered, what's happening there? Maybe I should go back and look. And he realized he wouldn't be able to do it because he had lived so long in India, his body had adapted to the Indian climate, to Indian food, to Indian medicine, to Indian languages, that he wouldn't survive the trauma of relocation back to a very different climate, different diet. Um, so he decided to stay put in India, and that's where he died, to all intents and purposes an Indian. But his most amazing accomplishment is he wrote uh, this history of uh, the Mughals. Um, and the language it's written in is bizarre. It's a mixture of Italian and French and Portuguese with uh, many, um, we could call them Brajbasha terms, some South Indian terms. But it's clear that uh, by the time he was in his um, middle age, the languages Manucci spoke were no longer the languages he spoke when he was a child. Uh, that he spoke uh, the sort of mixed uh, Italian-French language in order to speak to Europeans. Uh, and he spoke uh, a mixed uh, uh, North Indian language to speak to North Indians and uh, something else to speak to South Indians. It's a sign that language is never something entirely pure, uh, but is constantly adapting depending on the conversations one has and with whom one has them. Um, but uh, Minucci tried to get uh, this book published and uh, no one would publish it because they said, what is this book? It's written in a language that doesn't make sense. And it's written by a guy who doesn't sort of fit into any one cultural uh, peg. But that's precisely what makes the book so interesting to me. And I think in this way, Manucci is a little bit like modern Indians. 
all of us have had the experience of starting a thought in one language and then finishing it in another language. Even I find myself doing this now. I, I, I'll start a thought, maybe in English, uske baad Hindi mein hoga. So uh, uh, this is what we do in the subcontinent because we're constantly dealing with people who are different from us. It's one of the great resources of the continent, I think, is that we have to do this jugaad, where we are constantly saying, okay, you're different from me. How can I speak with you? How can I find some common ground with you so I'll be understandable to you? Uh, so that's one of the messages I want this book uh, to, to give to people. That's one of the most beautiful things about India is that it's not a singular tradition. It is rather a series of conversations between many, many different traditions. And rather than regarding these conversations as impure or somehow inferior to singular traditions, we should regard these conversations as one of the greatest resources the subcontinent has to offer the world at large. Uh, right. Uh, so, moving to uh, Garcia Davota, the Hakim of Bombay and Ahmednagar. So, how he became Indian? <laughs> so, Garcia Davota, who I've spoken about a little bit already today, um, came to uh, India supposedly as the personal physician of the Portuguese governor of Goa. Um, but he absconded to Ahmednagar uh, once the Inquisition was introduced in Goa because he was scared of being uh, outed as a Jew. Now, he had a garden in Goa in which he grew local plants. And he was a very curious man. Um, he was interested in the effects of local plants as medicines. So he tried out virtually everything on himself. Um, he even tried bhang. There's a part of uh, his tropical medical treatise where he talks about uh, the effects of bhang. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he always remained Jewish. He always remained, to a certain extent, Portuguese. But uh, when I say that he became Indian, I don't mean that he got an Indian passport or that his skin turned brown or that uh, somehow his DNA changed. I mean simply that uh, he adapted and took on board many elements of the local culture, uh, including the diet and the medicines. And he um, became, this is one of the things I love about him, he became an absolute aficionado of the mango. Whereas Thomas Stevens was a convert to the Narial, Garcia da Orta was an arm Adni. He was a mango man. And there's an extended part of his treatise where he, in the, it's such a recognizably Indian moment, he enters into a debate about what is the best kind of arm you can find in the subcontinent. Is it uh, the um, Safeda arm, the Langara arm, uh, the Imam Pasand arm? And he says, my favorite arm is the arm that comes from um, near what is now Hyderabad. Uh, so, when I was reading this, I, I, I was thinking, this sounds just like my father-in-law, who is a Malayali man, who would spend much of his uh, time after any meal debating at great length, what is the best mango available in India? Um, and here was Garcia da Orta, a Portuguese Jew, sounding just like him. So um, not every Ferengi was like this. Um, Many of the English colonists tried to remain as English as possible after coming here, uh, right down to drinking their tea with their little fingers extended like this and wearing their best English clothes, even in the blazing Indian summer sun. Um, Garcia de Orta instead adapted to the culture, adapted to the environment, learned the languages, and loved them. Uh, so... This is something that we need to recognize, that the experience of migration um, is not, at least to India, is not just about invasion or colonialism. It's often about falling in love. 
uh, that one comes to a new place and finds that it can be home uh, if one opens up to it. In, uh, I mean, there's a movie called The Physician where it shows that uh, someone from 11th century Britain travels to Isfahan to study under uh, Ibn Sina. Uh, so that's uh, the education, I mean, people are moving uh, or migrating because of education. I mean, under Akbar, I mean, India is considered to be one of the richest countries in the world, probably the richest. I mean, so did something like that happen? Yes. I mean, you look at Akbar's court and you look at uh, the Akbar Nama. Um, what is most striking about it is how multicultural the court is. Uh, many people migrated to, uh, from other parts of the world to serve Akbar in his court and, uh, you know, his descendants, Jahangir Shah Jahan as well. So we find the only... Um, Rangi, who is mentioned by name in the Tuzuk i Jahangri, um, is uh, someone named Hunarmand, um, which is, of course, a Persian term, also Urdu term, that means skillful. And this Hunarmand, I did some investigation, turned out to be um, a Basque Frenchman uh, named Augustin Iriard, uh, who was a jeweler who escaped France because he was uh, uh, an accused in a counterfeiting case. And he came to India thinking that his skill in jewelry, and in, in particular counterfeit jewelry, might be attractive to uh, Indian rulers. And so it proved. Jahangir commissioned him to build thrones, including the um, Takti Tabus, the, um, the peacock throne. Um, he wasn't the sole designer, but he was one of the chief designers of it. Um, so the courts of Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan were full of these uh, foreigners. Akbar also actively encouraged foreign communities to migrate to India. For instance, the Armenian community, which has a long, rich history in the subcontinent, uh, first came as a result of Akbar issuing a general invitation to Armenians who were being uh, oppressed at that time um, under Shah Abbas, particularly the Jewish Armenians in Isfahan and uh, um, uh, Kashan. Uh, a lot of the Armenians were actually Jewish who came to India. The great Sufi uh, poet, uh, there's a darga for him uh, in the Mina Bazaar near Jama Masjid. Uh, his name is Saeed uh, Sarmad. He is revered by uh, Sufis, by Muslims, by Hindus, but also by Jews, because he was Jewish. He was born a Jew. Um, so he was part of the large influx of Armenians who came to India at the request of uh, the Mughals. So um, this greatly benefited uh, the Mughals uh, financially, um, because uh, many of the uh, New people who came in belonged to trading communities that were internationally connected. But also, like Hunermund, uh, they possessed artisanal skills that proved extraordinarily not just useful, but culturally exhilarating. So Akbar's uh, Kitab Khana, his atelier of artists, included a number of artists of Ferengi origin. So I found one named Mandu Farangi, and Akbar engaged in this amazing experiment where he illustrated um, a Persian translation of the Ramayana uh, with paintings where he commissioned a Hindu painter and a Muslim painter to work together on illustrations, and occasionally a Christian painter would become part of the collaboration. And it was part of Akbar's deliberate strategy to say, we are multicultural. Uh, I am ruling a multicultural country. And the Ramayana is a Hindu text, but it is a text that can be enjoyed also by Muslims and Christians. Um, it's hard for us even now in our modern time to imagine this kind of thought experiment uh, where all forms of knowledge were potentially available for everyone rather than 
zealously owned and protected and militantly um, uh, defended uh, by one tradition at the expense of others. So I know that there is a lot of uh, history now that is seeking to uh, uh, stigmatize uh, uh, the Mughals, uh, to represent uh, the Mughal ascendancy as a time of unspeakable suffering uh, for Hindus in uh, North India. Uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, virtually any king or Maharaja at this time uh, engaged in the sort of politics of uh, domination, uh, which involved various forms of suppression, violence, ruining temples, and, and the like. Um, but uh, Akbar and uh, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, uh, these were figures under whom we also saw a lot of temple building and uh, an attempt to bring people into conversation with each other. And perhaps the culmination of this was uh, Shah Jahan's son, Darashiku, uh, whose amazing treatise, the Bahrain, the, the um, confluence of two seas, was an attempt to put Hindus and Muslims in dialogue with each other. We can still learn a lot from this now. Um, I don't see the Mughal period as a golden age. I, I think we're naive if we think there once was a golden age anywhere. But there are always lessons that can be learned from previous times. And uh, uh, this uh, ethos of dialogue and conversation, uh, uh, the, the confluence of the two seas that we see under Dara Shikul, for me, I find uh, both educational and moving in our current moment, where we're looking more and more to establish absolute uh, boundaries between Hindu and Muslim, between Jew and Muslim, between Christian and Muslim and whoever. Uh, and the fact is, we all have a lot to learn from each other because we are all different. Yeah, you talked about uh, the relationship of North India with these Firangis. Uh, what about South India? We know that, I mean, Krishna Devaraya, uh, I mean, Vijayanagar under Krishna Devaraya, they used to trade with yes. uh, Portuguese occupied Goa because of horse trading and economic advantages. Similarly, in the Battle of Raichur, uh, there was a Portuguese contingent, right, which yes. helped Krishna Devaraya to to conquer Raichur, and it was a very strategic fort and win for for him. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, did they really settle in India, or it just was a temporary uh, business business uh, relationship between them? Well, there there were the Portuguese were the jokers in the pack. Uh, they became involved in local politics in uh, South India in. Uh, uh, the Malabar state and what, uh, the, what became the Travancore state before it was absorbed into to Kerala. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, various people came sort of uh, in the footsteps of the Portuguese and allied themselves with uh, local powers. So, for instance, uh, the Travancore Maharajas uh, depended to a large extent on uh, uh, a Dutch soldier. Um, who um, ended up uh, dying in uh, Travancore, li living most of his life uh, there. You can still see his memorial. It's near um, uh, Kanyakumari, and uh, the memorial is in Dutch and in Tamil. Um, but uh, yes, there was a significant uh, presence of Ferangis in the south as well. Not least because South India, even after the Portuguese takeover of the Indian Ocean Trading Route, South India still remained uh, a very important hub in trade with the Far East. Um, we can tell this from Sri Lanka and the extraordinary ethnic diversity of Sri Lanka. So many different peoples ended up there, uh, not only the Sinhalese and the Tamils, but uh, uh, people of English, Dutch, uh, Jewish origin, Portuguese origin uh, are still part of the, the gene pool in, in Sri Lanka, and ditto in uh, South India. Um, so there's still many more stories of uh, Farangis in the South that need to be dug up, particularly uh, the Jesuit presence in the South. Uh, uh, Jesuit priests like uh, Roberto Beschi, um, who went native 
and ended up writing Tamil Puranas, uh, some of which are regarded now still by uh, Tamil scholars as uh, great canonical works in Tamil tradition. Um, and uh, these Jesuits often had uh, slightly malign uh, goals. They wanted to convert people to Christianity. Um, but uh, some of the Jesuits, like uh, Thomas Stevens, uh, became less evangelical for Christianity and became genuinely interested in the local cultures. Uh, so time and time again, we find that uh, in these uh, scenes where we expect there to be a, a sort of horrible colonial uh, presence, there are more kinds of intercultural conversation happening than we'd realize. European uh, or Firangi laid uh, their way to uh, India through naval power, their superior naval power. So tell us something about uh, such merchant there. You have mentioned some Malik Ayaz of uh, Diu and Chinali of Portugal. Yes. So tell us something about them, how they settled there. Oh, they're both interesting. So Malik Ayaz um, uh, of Diu, um, he was the, uh, the governor of Diu uh, before the Portuguese took it over. Um, his name suggests that he, he was uh, Muslim. He was, in fact, originally a Christian slave, uh, probably uh, of uh, Caucasian origin, Georgian Caucasian Christian origin. And he had arrived uh, uh, less through the sea route and more through the overland route. He had been captured as a slave, and he had uh, clearly he had spent time in, uh, in Basra, um, in uh, what is now Iraq, uh, before migrating east. Um, and so he arrived uh, partly as a result of the overland Silk Road trade. We often romanticize the Silk Road. We think of, you know, silk and carpets and caravans and so on. But the Silk Road trade, one of its biggest commodities was slaves. It could have easily been called the slave road uh, trade. And there were huge numbers of slaves from the... Uh, Russian slave markets. Uh, in fact, the word slave comes from the word Slav. Um, and the Byzantines, like the Romans, uh, called their slaves Slavs uh, because that's where they tended to come from. But Slavic slaves were shipped all the way uh, across the Silk Road and down into India. And Malika Ayaz was one of them. But he became an admiral of uh, the, the local uh, due fleet, um, and he seems to have become quite skillful as an admiral. Um, so he went to war with the Portuguese. He even tried to enter into a union with the Portuguese to save Dieu. Um, but uh, And he also built uh, technologically very advanced for its time, uh, underwater um, uh, gate that protected Dieu from invasion. Um, and then Chinali is a very interesting Ferangi. He's called a Ferangi because he was baptized Bartholomew, but he too was a slave. Um, he was possibly ethnic Chinese, but most likely Malay, who'd been brought by the Portuguese, bought by the Portuguese, and, uh, and uh, converted to Christianity. He harbored deep hatred for the Portuguese, and so he... Uh, he uh, joins the forces of the local Kunyali Murakar, who is a Mapala uh, Muslim uh, warlord on the Malabar coast. And he fought for him as his right-hand man. And he was one of the, the fiercest, or well, the Portuguese regarded Chinali as a pirate. Um, but, you know, you're a pirate only if you're the enemy. Um, if you're on the side of the locals, then you're a freedom fighter. So Chinali was regarded as one of the, the great freedom fighters uh, of um, the Malabar uh, area um, in the wars against the Portuguese. Um, but uh, it's interesting that uh, Chinali had learned a lot of his skill um, as a, a seaman uh, from his time with the Portuguese as a galley slave. He was extraordinarily gifted, it seems, in uh, uh, 
working uh, small ships, not just in the open seas, but in the backwaters of Kerala. Um, and uh, the Portuguese were always complaining that uh, it was close to impossible to, to beat uh, Chin Ali. Um, his name seems to be Chin Ali, Chinese Ali. So he uh, was made to convert again or chose to convert again to Islam. Um, uh, from his uh, name of Bartholomew, but the Portuguese insisted on calling him Bartholomew after they captured him and subsequently executed him. So, uh, I mean, in your book, you talk about, uh, right, India is a land of fakirs, and you talk about how some of these Ferengis ended up becoming fakirs themselves. Uh, so how did that happen? Well, there's one uh, in particular, uh, a fellow named Thomas Coriat, uh, who uh, was of reasonable means. He wasn't quite as poor as uh, many of the other Ferengis who migrated to the subcontinent. But by the time he arrived in India, he was. Because he took a really bizarre decision. He decided to walk all the way to India. Now, in some ways, the decision made sense. He'd become something of a celebrity in England. Uh, he was a contemporary of Shakespeare's. He probably knew Shakespeare. He certainly knew some of Shakespeare's friends like Ben Johnson and John Donne. Um, but he had become a celebrity, Thomas Coriat, in England because he'd walked around Europe for uh, six months and he'd written up a travelogue of all his experiences in Europe and it had become a bestseller in London. So he was wondering, what should I do as my follow-up? So he said, I know, I'll walk to India. He walked to India, he got mugged in Persia and lost all his money. Uh, and he somehow made his way to Ajmer, uh, where at the time uh, Jahangir was based. Um, this was in 1615. Uh, Jahangir was uh, fighting some local Rajput uh, um, Raja and decided to headquarter himself in Ajmer uh, for strategic purposes. Um, now, Coriat uh, by this time was grindingly poor, but he seems to be an unusually gifted in languages. He picked up, uh, while he was walking through Asia for three years, he picked up Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, and was fluent in all of them by the time he arrived. And in Ajmer, he got away with speaking uh, Persian and Arabic, but he also realized he'd have to learn the local dialect. Some Rajasthani version of Brajbash or Hindavi. And he became fluent in that too. But uh, there was no way for him to make money other than to beg for it outside the Darga Sharif in Ajmer, uh, the Darga of Moinuddin Chishti, uh, the, the Sufi saint uh, who was buried there. And uh, Koryat longed to speak with Jahangir. Uh, of course, he couldn't because he was just a beggar. But uh, he decided that Jahangir must be a decent type because every year during the Urs Mela for Moinuddin Chishti, uh, Jahangir would fill a huge dig, a cauldron, with kichiri for the poor and feed the poor. So Koryat would eat kichiri uh, from this dig. So he decided Jahangir was a really decent chap, and he eventually managed to gate crash uh, the daily darbar that Jahangir had with his subjects. Uh, Jahangir was speaking from his jharoka at the Akbari Kila, the Akbari Fort in Ajmer. And Koryat surprised everyone by delivering an oration in Persian, in which he said, I am a fakir. Darwish, from Anglistan. And he said, I have come here simply to find the grave of your great, 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 great grandfather, Timur. Um, so I ask you for two things, for safe passage to Samarkand, so I can see his grave, and just a little bit of money to help me out. Jahangir gave him 100 rupees, which was a windfall at that time. And this bankrolled Koryat to go on walking to Delhi and, and so on. He never made it to Samarkand, unfortunately. 
But I find it extraordinary that an Englishman at a time uh, when we would think, oh, the English are beginning to imagine colonizing India. The East India Company has just been set up. Uh, the ambassador, Thomas Rowe, has been set up, uh, sent to India to uh, uh, develop a trading deal with, with Jahangir. Meanwhile, there's another Englishman here who is a beggar in Ajmer. And not just a beggar, but someone who has learned the languages and thinks of himself as a fakir. I find that extraordinary. It's such a difference from the colonial mindset of a Thomas Rowe, who told all his men who were in Ajmer, do not dress like an Indian, do not learn Indian languages. When we present ourselves to Jahangir, we will present ourselves wearing English clothes and speaking English. Whereas Thomas Coriat presented as a desi, um, a desi who loved kichiri. Uh, and that's the common thread in my stories. Kichiri, Aam, Narial, over and over again, these Farangis, um, it's not just that they loved Indian foods, they opened themselves up to a vast palette of Indian cultural traditions, possibilities, ways of thinking. Um, and so we find that the history of migration to India is not just about invaders, colonists, imperialists. It's also about these unexpected people who came and, as I've said before, fell in love with local tradition. Earlier, you talked about you are currently working on uh, history of Jews and the Silk Road. Yep. So how is that coming along and when can we expect it to be on the market? Well, I, I'm hoping I've finished the book and I'm hoping that it will be out uh, sometime next year. I've just got to find a publisher who will agree to include all the photographs. I have about 200 photographs in this book. Um, but uh, it's uh, coming along nicely, and uh, it's a book. Uh, I, I love writing these books because I feel I learn a lot as I write the books. Um, and uh, what this book has taught me is that we are much more connected across the world than we think we are. And The Silk Road is a tale not of a people or of a nation, but of an entire network of connections that resulted in India and Europe being intimately connected in ways that we haven't realized. So for instance, did you know that about 2000 years ago, a Jew in Antioch, whose native language was Greek, met an Indian Buddhist monk from Gujarat all because of the Silk Road. And they spoke with each other in Aramaic, which was the language of the Persian Empire. It also became the language of Jesus Christ and the language of Jews, but it was spoken in Gujarat at the time because Gujarat was connected uh, to the Persian Empire. Uh, so the Silk Road uh, makes us realize that none of us have lived on islands or in fortresses. Uh, we may have visited them, but uh, the world has always been interconnected. And that uh, so much of what we think of as the most vibrant, creative cultural legacies are a result of these incredible connections. So, uh, yeah, thanks for talking about your book uh, and your future projects and joining us uh, and giving us uh, time to talk about your book. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, and uh, we look forward to uh, the publication of your book. Hopefully we can invite you again. And uh, yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mitilesh, for, for having me. Uh, you know the, the phrase from the Bollywood film? Mogambo Kushwa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hopefully you liked this episode, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.